Good morning and welcome to another lesson. Today's lesson is focusing on um, a literacy text on mystery stories. There'll be myself and Miss Copper and it's a two part lesson. So we'll be doing the first part today and the second part in two weeks time. So by the end of these two sessions, you'll be able to write your own mystery story. But today we're going to be focusing on writing a setting description. Have a think if you've seen any cartoons or any films with a mystery um, plot. Something like Scooby-Doo would be one. Tintin is another mystery cartoon. If you haven't watched any of those, it might be time to just go and have a look. You will need a pencil, some paper, and also some space where you've, you're, it's a quiet space for you to concentrate. And remember, it's really important that you can pause the video, work on whatever we've asked you to, and then either send the work to us to check or check the answers that we've got. Okay, so what does a mystery story contain? What are the features of a mystery story? We often have the main character, if you like, the detective that's trying to solve what the mystery is. We have detailed descriptions to create suspense, short snappy sentences to create an effect, sometimes making you feel scared or wondering what's going to happen next. A mysterious setting or a sub series of surprised events. A red herring, which is something that happens that puts you off what the actual end is going to be. And a brief resolution to solve the mystery. So in the end, you do find out what actually happened. So the puzzle, if you like, the mystery is solved. Now I've got a few books here for you. The Thing in the Basement, The Mystery of the Haunted House, Roll Dance, the BFG, Gangster Granny and the London Eye Mystery. And what I'd like to, you to do in a moment is to pause the film and sort these books out. Is that book a mystery or is it another? So it could be a story. So pause and have a go. So I hope you've done that. And let's find out the thing in the basement. Whoa, what is that thing? That's definitely a mystery story. The mystery of the haunted house. Well, it's in the title, there's a mystery and it's a haunted house. The big friendly giant, that's just a story. Gangster Granny, that's another story. The London Eye mystery, it's in the title. I wonder what happens in that book. So check your work and correct it. We've got a new word, word of the day, quivering. Quivering. Well then, and quivering is an adjective and it means when something is trembling or shaking with a slight rapid motion. It could be branches, it could be a piece of paper if it's half stuck to the floor or a leaf. Now we're going to watch a clip. Please listen. It's the mystery of the haunted manor. One step at a time, Lara crept down the stairs. At the bottom, she paused, but all that she could hear was blood thumping in her ears. She'd be back before they awoke. Twenty minutes later, she entered Harrow Woods. Her torchlight found the path and occasionally flashed to show her the black, quivering leaves. Dark clouds had muted the moon. Before long, she came to the ruins of the manor house. In the front garden, the fountain was still and smothered in years of moss. Overgrown rose bushes blocked the path painted thick with fallen petals. Warily, Lara perched on the edge of the fountain, took her camera from her bag and faced the trees. It was here that she had first seen it. This time, she'd be ready. After a few moments, she heard the wind awaken in the woods. The water rippled, the trees rustled and a damp petal landed on her cheek. Lara shivered. Behind her, a door slammed. What was that? She whipped round to face the house. A shadow moved through the downstairs room. A light flickered on. Lara ran. 
shoving her camera back in her bag as she scrambled away from the fountain. She was sure she could hear something cracking the dry twigs behind her as she sped through the woods. She didn't stop until she reached Meadow Drive, where she paused by a lamppost to catch her breath. Next time, she thought. Next time, she'd be ready. So the Manor House, you've just watched that clip, you've heard the story. Now, what I'd like you to do is to pause and read this. There's two pages. Then at the end, we've got a few questions for you to answer. So feel free to read, pause, read the next page and pause. And then you've got these questions to answer. So you might want to just rewind. Well done, welcome back. Okay, so hopefully you've got your answers. Please do send those in. Your parents can take a photo of it. You can take a photo of it and send it to us either via our own email or through Purple Mash. Right, so let's have a look at a setting. What does a good setting description look like? What are its features? And can we magpie, can we borrow any of these ideas to use for our own? Because remember, at the end of this video, you'll be writing your own setting description. Let's find out. So these are the features. We need to use all of our senses to describe our surroundings, what we can see, what we can hear, what we can touch or feel, depending on what the weather's like. And if we can smell anything, it might be an old, damp environment. We're going to be using expanded noun phrases, which I'm going to show you how to use in a minute. And we're also going to be using ad fronted adverbial phrases. Again, I'll be teaching you those in a few minutes. And prepositions. Where am I? Am I in front of a rose bush? Am I underneath this massive haunted house? That's why we need those prepositions there. Let's have a look. What is an expanded noun phrase? An expanded noun phrase gives much more detail than a simple noun phrase. So if with our noun, a teacher, for example, we're going to add another noun, a maths teacher, and we're going to add adjectives to modify it. So now it's a helpful, friendly maths teacher. And when you're writing these down in your setting, you need to remember to have the adjective, a comma, an adjective, and then your noun. Now, a little task for you. How many expanded noun phrases can you think of to describe different things in this picture? Pause the video. You may want to go back to look at that expanded noun phrase poster that we just saw and write as many as you like. Try writing at least four, and I'm going to challenge some of you to write more than six. Don't forget to send them in to your teacher. Well done. Off we go to what is a fronted adverbial? An adverbial is a word, phrase or clause, which is a series of words that is used just like an adverb to describe the verb. And they usually go at the front of sentences. That's why it's called fronted, because it's at the front of a sentence. Fronted adverbials are used to describe the time something happens before sunrise. Darius crept into the beast's cave. A fronted adverbial is used to describe the frequency, how often something happens. Every so often, Darius could hear the beast's ferocious snore. It's used to describe the place that something happens. At the back of the cave, exactly telling us where that happens so that we, as the reader, can build a picture in our head. It also tells us the manner something happens, so as quick as a flash, how something is happened, and the possi possibility, how likely is something to happen? Almost certainly the deadly beast would have found Darius. So you might want to pause and go through these again, maybe coming up with your own examples. Did you notice?
notice how the fronted adverbials were punctuated. We've got that fronted adverbial and a comma. Fronted adverbial, comma. Fronted adverbial, comma. So after that fronted adverbial, we have a comma to finish off our sentence. That's really important because in your task here, I would like you to read these sentences and see if you can recognise where the fronted adverbial is. It's always going to be at the front, but where does it stop? And put commas in. Pause and have a go at this at home. Well done. Let's have a look. Are they in the right places? Clumsily. How did he do that? Like an erupting volcano. My little commas moved there. See there. How they did it. Although it was raining, telling us what the surroundings are like. And that adverbial of possibility. The children still went on the school trip. Well done for having a go at this. So now, back to our setting description. We said we needed all these features. And here's an example. 20 minutes later, she entered Harrow Woods. Her torchlight found the path and occasionally flashed to show her the black, quivering, word of the day, leaves. Pause and remind yourself, what does quivering mean? If you can't remember, don't worry, just go back to that word of the day slide and remind yourselves. Well done. Dark clouds had muted the moon. Muted the moon? The moon doesn't have any sound, so how could it have been put on mute? I think the dark clouds covered the moonlight so we couldn't see them. Before long, fronted of Burberry there, she came to the ruins of the manor house. In the front garden, the fountain was still and smothered in years of moss. Overgrown rose bushes blocked the path painted thick with fallen petals. Now your job is, if you can, to get these four coloured pencils, a pink, an orange, a green and a blue. If not, don't worry, use the numbers. And as you reread this, I'd like you, actually what you could also do is write this out to use it as handwriting practice. And then with those colours, you could underline the different features. Make sure that you're matching them up. So pause the video. Write this paragraph, this setting description and see if you can highlight the features. Well done, let's correct your work. Well done, welcome back. Let's see if what you've circled or what you've written in those different colours were right. So we're looking at these features. We've got some um, description words there using your senses. We've got our expanding noun phrases here, black quivering leaves. We've got our fronted adverbials 20 minutes later in the front garden. Overgrown rose bushes. And we've also got our prepositions in the front of. Um, I think that's probably the only preposition we've got there. So well done if you found those, fantastic. We're going to work on a little description together. So we're going to have a look at this picture. Think about some words that might be coming to you. Maybe you can pause the picture and write some words at the top of your paper. Words that you would use to describe. Think about your senses. What smell would you, would you be smelling? What would you see? Lots of rubble, um, it looks very um, sort of untidy, it might smell dusty, it might smell damp. Um, think about those expanded noun phrases in front of the verbials, so in front of me, behind the highest building. Pause the video and write some words to help you. OK, 
Okay, so let's try and use some of the words that you came up with, and we're going to put all of those in a setting description. So if I was just standing here, in, we're going to start with capital letter, in front of me. There's already my front of a verbial phrase in front of me. Well, I think that was a street. It looks like it. The street. was full with rubble, rubble. Rubble is all these bits of rocks and stones that have obviously fallen off the building, was full with rubble. Let's see what else, I've got some words to help me. Um, if I had to walk over, I think the floor would be quite uneven. Uneven surfaces. Oh, with, with, I've just used, um, I think I'll change that and just have bits of building broken I can see that there would have been some windows there I can see there's a little sort of crane there working I wonder what would have happened maybe it's a demolition site when they need to get rid of an unsafe building broken window panes Window panes are what you call the actual glass in the windows. Uh, they're usually held in with metal frames. So maybe, um, I think it would be quite cold. So cold metal frames and well, there'll be all sorts of things, so I'm just going to write um, an other, other, um, any words that you might have on your word mat, you might want to include them, other damaged items. So at the moment, I'm standing still in my, in the setting, I've described a little bit of what I can see. I'm going to start stepping forward. As I step forward, being careful of where I put my feet. Come on. As I step forward, I've got that front of the verbial there. I'm going to stop here, but what I'd like you to do is see if you can finish off writing this character, sorry, this setting description. As I step forward, being careful of where I put my feet. Why? There might be broken, pointed bits of stone. There might be sharp, glistening glass. So think about using your senses as you carry on moving in this picture. I know Miss Copper and I would love to see this work, so as soon as you finish it, please take a photo of it and send it to us. Okay, so on to our final task. And you're going to watch a little clip now. And I'd like you to listen to the first chapter of a new book.
a new story. And that book is called The Mystery of the London Eye. The London Eye Mystery. Chapter 1. A Giant Bicycle Wheel in the Sky. My favourite thing to do in London is to fly the eye. On a clear day you can see for 25 miles in all directions because you are in the largest observation wheel ever built. You're sealed into one of the 32 capsules with the strangers who are next to you in the queue and when they close the doors the sound of the city is cut off. You begin to rise. The capsules are made of glass and steel and are hung from the rim of the wheel. As the wheel turns the capsules use the force of gravity to stay upright. It takes 30 minutes to go a full circle. From the top of the ride, Cats' London looks like Toy Town and the cars on the roads below look like abacus beads going left and right and stopping and starting. I think London looks like London and the cars like cars, only smaller. The best thing to see from up there is the River Thames. You can see how it loops and curves, but when you're on the ground you think it is straight. The next best thing to look at is the spokes and metallic hawsers of the eye itself. You're looking at the only cantilevered structure of its kind on Earth. It's designed like a giant bicycle wheel in the sky, supported by a massive A-frame. It's also interesting to watch the capsules on either side of yours. You see strangers looking out just like you are doing. The capsule that's higher than yours becomes lower than yours, and the capsule that's lower becomes higher. You have to shut your eyes because it makes a strange feeling go up your esophagus. You're glad the movement is smooth and slow. And then your capsule goes lower, and you're sad because you did not want the ride to end. You'd like to go round one more time, but it's not allowed. So you get out, feeling like an astronaut coming down from space, a little lighter than you were. We took Celine to the eye, because he'd never been up before. A stranger came up to us in the queue, offering us a free ticket. We took it and gave it to Celine. We shouldn't have done this, but we did. He went up on his own at 11.32, 24th of May, and was due to come down at 12.02 the same day. He turned and waved to Cat and me as he boarded, but you couldn't see his face, just his shadow. They sealed him in with 20 other people whom we didn't know. Cat and I tracked Salim's capsule as it made its orbit. When it reached its highest point, we both said, NOW! at the same time, and Cat laughed and I joined in. That's how we knew we'd been tracking the right one. We saw the people bunch up as the capsule came back down, facing northeast towards the automatic camera for the souvenir photograph. There were just dark bits of jackets, legs, dresses and sleeves. Then the capsule landed. The doors opened and the passengers came out in twos and threes. They walked off in different directions. Their faces were smiling. Their paths probably never crossed again. But Celine wasn't among them. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little clip we put together for you. That first chapter came from the book The London Eye Mystery. And now we've got a little task for you because we would like you to write a setting description for the London Eye Mystery. So you might want to rewind, watch that video clip again with the hustle and bustle of the crowded people, the warm sun, or maybe it was a fresh, cool day. Put yourself in that setting with Salim and Kat and Ted and Imagine looking around, what will you see? Use those features, those four features that we looked at, using all of your senses, using expanded noun phrases, fronted adverbials and prepositions. We would love to see your work, so please make sure that if you write it down on a piece of paper, that you take a photo and your parents or someone can send it to us, or maybe you can write it on a template in Purple Mash. Send it to your teacher, because we would love to see it. Thank you, and see you soon. Bye-bye.